So, where would you like to begin? Hmm. My guess, kind of like how I got into psychoanalysis. Great. Which was by accident. I didn't know that I was going to see a psychoanalyst. And <clears throat> I had been seeing someone who was a psychotherapist who's a psychologist and I was, you know, there's kind of like a difference between talking um, with another therapeutic listener who's an analyst and one who's not. And, and so it just felt like I was kind of monologuing to myself. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> I sought out a different therapist and um, a friend of mine recommended him and I went to see him and I told him that I wanted to find my voice and um, you know he, he said I was uh, built for that chair I was sitting in and um, you know and I kind of described some of my goals and stuff like that and that really made me feel like Wow. Okay. This is interesting. And, um, you know, I, I came to find out that he was an interpersonal psychoanalyst and we had this kind of like ongoing conflict between how much he talked and how much I talked and which is ironic because I came to find my voice and so that was a that was a real kind of agonizing tension throughout the treatment and he was a really flawed analyst in a lot of ways and he was also brilliant and i he's dead now but i still think of him very fondly and our treatment ended in a very kind of car crashy kind of way and um but i learned so much from from being in treatment with him and there was i had this experience of sort of coming into the session in one frame of mind and leaving the session and this like i was wearing a new pair of glasses and just kind of like looking out into the world of New York City with like just a totally new lens. And I was like, wow, this is an amazing feeling. And that kind of got me interested in wanting to investigate what this analytic experience was more. And so that's kind of how I, you know, ended up going to graduate school. And then I entered psychoanalytic training. And um, Yeah, that's kind of like how I got into it. I love it. I was thinking that just the other day too about um, analysis because sometimes I get frustrated with the field and I'm like, why am I telling people to do this? But even with like the flawed analysts that I've had, it's still been super transformative and generative for me. So it's like, even if there's like problems with the dynamic or you don't like the way someone's working, you still end up learning like a lot about yourself from that. Um, yeah, so you, so you don't have to have the perfect the perfect analyst or, you know, I mean, I wouldn't even say even a great one. <laughs> Hopefully they're, they're, they do, right? They're good enough, right? The good enough model. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really reject that. I, I don't, I don't want to see a perfect analyst. I don't want to see an analyst who's fully formed. I don't want to see an analyst whose training is fully complete. Um, that just, what, what could I learn from that? What would they have to offer me if they had, if they knew everything? So yeah, that's the thing too. I, I, I think my best analysis was with someone who was in training that was a candidate somewhere that I saw for like ten dollars a session when I was in grad school, and then the one. I mean, I got a lot of out of because it was like three years, but the one that I liked the least was with the training analyst at an institute, you know? 
Fascinating. Spe spe specifically for that reason, because I just felt like he was so sure of himself. Whereas the candidate, I feel like, gave me a lot of space and was quiet and only said something if he was like, felt really sure of what to say or if it just came out spontaneously, I think, because he wasn't as sure of himself. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, that analysis had a, had a formative impact on me, um, you know, and I, I kind of like, you know, there's a lot of identification that happened there. And I think I came into training, like, as an interpersonal psychoanalyst in a way, that's kind of how I was see, seeing myself and came in with like a lot of kind of arrogance, I think, like, oh, you know, I've, 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 uh, been with an interpersonal psychoanalyst and, you know, he would, cause he would give me books to read and he would like turn me on to different theorists like Edgar Levinson and, um, other interpersonalists like Harry Stack Sullivan. And so I felt like I came into training with kind of like this leg up and I was, um, and then I kind of got into what I would call the, um, intersubjective mafia, which is Robert Stalbro, George Atwood, Donna Orange, and Bernie Branshaft, who, um, I don't know if you're familiar with many of their writings, but they, they often like write together. And so they're kind of this formidable analytic uh, unit that um, writes a lot about intersubjective systems theory. And I think Stalero calls it phenomenological contextualism these days. But that was another kind of like thing I took on and became very arrogant about. Um, and this, you know, kind of in this way, my, my training, I sort of skipped over a lot of basics and went to it's like, you're playing a video game and somehow you like went through this door and you ended up on the the 10th level, but you missed all these other levels you're supposed to go through. That's kind of like how I felt um, in a way. Um, so, you know, I really, I really didn't go back to the basics towards the end of my training. You know, I had a couple of classes on Freud and but that, that was it really. It wasn't until I, I was in a, a class where they had a guest analyst each week and there was a Freudian who came in and there was something about the way he was being in the class that was very seductive and compelling to me and kind of beguiling. And I had some kind of incomplete thought and he was like, yeah, go on. And I felt like I was like, oh, oh, like this is what it means to kind of reach into your unconscious and kind of try to find the thread and keep pulling it to see wherever it goes. And so that was kind of like this awakening moment for me that happened toward the end of my training. So I was like, I kind of like got things in reverse in a way and, you know, started in supervision with him and I've been in supervision with him for three years now. And that's been extremely generative. And it's kind of like a, he blends some, he doesn't see such a fine demarcation between supervision and analysis. So there's a little bit of a blend, which I like because it's, I don't see how you can not talk about your own psychology when you discuss working with patients. Um, yeah, so it's taken me on this kind of journey of going back into the roots of psychoanalysis. So it's, it's kind of, I kind of have this interesting perspective in that I went to an institute that trained a lot of different orientations. And so I became very well-versed in relational psychoanalysis, intersubjective systems, contemporary self-psychology. So I'm kind of like bringing all those frames of reference into my readings of now Freud, um, 
be on the con. And so I, I'm, I don't regret kind of like the path I took. It's, I think it gives me a kind of a unique perspective. Um, yeah, I love being eclectic in that way. And that's the psychoanalytic psychotherapy st study center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will, will you talk a little bit about different, these different kinds of views? Cause I always have a lot of Lacanians on cause that's who I know. So I always get excited when I have people also from other different points of views, you know, different theoretical orientations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, got into self psychology and contemporary self. Um, there's a lot of slippage between like self psychology, contemporary self, intersubjective self, relational self. There's all these kind of like nuances between these different um, frames of reference. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say like kind of my entry point was intersubjective systems theory. And I was in supervision with Dory Sorter, who um, co edited this book toward an emancipatory psychoanalysis. And it's um, a collection of Bernie Branchaff's um, writings, who I highly recommend. He has a very famous article called Systems of Pathological Accommodation. And <clears throat> basically, it's, talk it's talking about using kind of a self and intersubjective approach, talking about um, how as children, we learn to accommodate to our parents um, in order to preserve the, the tie. And that uh, we do so at the expense of our psychological distinctiveness. And what's really fascinating to me about that too, is to apply that to the psychoanalytic situation and to always kind of be aware of the possibility of the patient accommodating to our theoretical preferences. And so I think that's, a, that's always a good thing to keep in mind as an analyst. Yeah, so that, 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 that's a big influence on me in terms of, of theory and becoming dogmatic about theory and also just being just being skeptical of theoretical of relying too heavily on theory it's not like oh let's just uh throw away the book but let's let's make sure we understand i think that was another thing that kind of Stollero and, and Atwood wrote this book, Faces in the Cloud. And it's basically, are you familiar with that book? No, I'm, I'm noting all of these books. <laughs> I'm looking them up as we speak, so I remember to uh, look he them this, up. He wrote this book, Faces in the Cloud, and it's about, um, it's, they do kind of a psychobiography of Freud, Jung, um, I forget the two other analysts, I don't want to misspeak, but basically talking about how their personalities are interwoven with their theories. Mm -hmm. And so um, so there, there's a big, there's a big emphasis in intersubjective systems theory about um, context and being aware of our own organizing principles. Intersubjective systems theory sees transference as kind of like the way, I, I like this definition because it's very expansive and usable. It's, it's basically the way that we organize the world. And so it's, it's less like we're transferring something from the past onto the analyst, but what's happening between the analyst and uh, whatever's happening in the room, I'm filtering as the patient through my organizing principles, through my transference, but it's based on what's happening right now in the context of our relationship. Um, so, 
So it's it's kind of a collision between these different subjectivities, between the subjectivity of the analyst and the subjectivity of the patient. And so the way the patient is acting is uh, depends on on the way the analyst is acting. So I think I'm not sure if they would argue this, but you know, it's sort of the idea that someone has borderline personality disorder would be kind of uh, not make sense in, in this paradigm. Basically, someone who had what others might call borderline personality disorder would be someone who was who was not having a enough of an empathically attuned attuned environment yet. So um, we're all capable of exhibiting symptoms of borderline personality disorder. If you've been in a serious, intimate relationship, you know what it feels like to lose control of your emotions, to split, to um, devalue, to, you know, so it's, it's, it's dependent on the interpersonal context that you're in. So, um, so diagnoses is kind of this one person psych psychological approach, whereas they're talking about more of an intersubjective co-created um, phenomena. Exactly, because like a, there's a dynamic between two people. So what I'm seeing with you, you might bring out different qualities in me than when I'm with somebody else, they might trigger or bring out other kind of dynamics. Exactly. Exactly. So intersubjective systems is um, empathy is a very kind of high, there's a big, there's a high emphasis on empathy, you know, and, and I think that there's value to that. And I think there's limitations to it as well. I think that um, empathy and understanding kind of only go so far. And I think that's, that's what some other theorists help me with, you know, and that just comes from my own experience of, of working with people and saying things that I think would provide the experience of being understood. And they're like, yes, and what else you got for me? And that, that, that really kind of wasn't enough. And yeah, become a, a a lot more interested lately, and in, um, in putting off understanding. And you know, the other day I, I tweeted something about this. Edgar Levinson has these visual aids to to listening, and one of them was um, this horizon line. And above the horizon line is meaning making and abstracting and interpreting and making sense. And below the horizon line is not understanding, deconstructing, waiting, not knowing. And so really as an as I'm trying like how to stay below that line as much as possible. And it's funny because, you know, a lot of analysts later in their careers and their writings are they're basically like, yeah, I, I, I really interpret anymore. And I think because I think they've come to this realization late in their late in their life that, you know, it really, you know, and Freud says this in one of his papers on beginning treatment, like, it doesn't matter how you could have the most accurate, true interpretation in the world. And if the patient's not ready to hear it, or if it's just intellectual, it's really not going to change anything. So, um, you know, in interpersonal psychoanalysis, there's this idea called the detailed inquiry. Are you familiar with this? Um, do you mind if I ask you if you're familiar with it or is it? No, it's okay. fine. Okay. Um, and it's basically kind of not taking anything for granted when you hear a patient tell their story. So anything that kind of you have a um, something that doesn't quite gel in their narrative, 
you would pay attention to or something that you're kind of like, wait, I'm not sure how he got from A to B. And so you would ask more, for more information. And so the more information you gather, the more complex and confusing the narrative becomes. So it's, it's, it's kind of like um, navigating this tension between understanding and not understanding, because the more questions you ask, the more complex it becomes, but also the more you're clarifying the situation. But so, but I'm in doing that, I'm still trying to not rush to any conclusion about what's going on. I really don't know what, I mean, I think it's easy to uh, forget how complex we are and how it can feel and how much anxiety it feels not knowing. And so in the, the deconstruction and the, the not knowing and the misunderstanding, there's anxiety there. And, you know, Her uh, Harold Searles, are you familiar with, with him, his writing at all? Yeah, he's, he's got a great paper called The Dedicated Physician. And he talks a lot about the trying to kind of, um, it's not a paper, it's a chapter in one of his books. Um, he talks about the need to help and, you know, like in one sense, of course, we're there to help, but it's also a very misleading concept in a way as psychoanalysts. Um, and he talks about how, how compelling it can be to kind of continue to see yourself in that role as the helper, as the dedicated analyst who's going to get to the bottom of things and how that can, you can unwittingly reinforce this dynamic of the person who's helping and the person who's getting helped and kind of reinforcing this kind of parent child relationship in a way too where in order to benefit from what I have to offer as an analyst, you need to continue to remain whatever, um, disorganized, um, in distress, um, lacking meaning. And so it sets up this kind of um, bind for the patient. And so, so Searle's, suggests being aware of when the patient is improving. And so that's necessarily going to mean that we have to confront some feelings in our, in ourselves, some envy of how the patient is excelling in this area that we may struggle in. Um, um, yeah, like, that they may have some qualities that we ourselves don't have. And so being, being aware of that and not, and not overlooking that, which kind of like, I'm just like following this thread now. <laughs> like, Great. <laughs> uh, yes. Which I think, I think Bromberg kind of picked up on, which is the importance of recognizing all the different parts of the patient. And so this happens in an addiction a lot where someone who's struggling with addictive experiences, they come in and the addiction's bad. I want to get rid of it. How do we solve this? And I like to facilitate a kind of reorientation to the issue which is like, I want to hear like, what's good about the addiction? Like, let's talk about um, what you like. Oh no, what do you, what do you mean? What do I like about it? I don't, I don't want to talk about that. No, I mean, um, what, what do you mean? That's what I'm trying to stop. Well, if, if, 
if it, if there wasn't anything you liked about it, it would be easy to stop. So I'm really interested in, in hearing about what you like about it. What does it do for you? And so even if someone is making improvement in an area, you might be tempted as an analyst to be like, oh, that was great. What was it like to not um, engage in whatever addictive experience it was? Uh, you know, kind of like focus the conversation on that. Actually, I want to hear about like the other part too. Like, did you miss anything about not being able to engage in that experience? Um, because I don't, I don't want that part of the person. I don't want the patient to have the experience where parts of me are good and parts of me are bad. So like, actually I'm interested in all, I, I want to know more about this part that like missed drinking or missed looking at porn or whatever it is. Um, and so that kind of like, I guess that kind of leads me to modern psychoanalysis. Are you familiar with modern psychoanalysis? Yeah, the, the recent person I interviewed was Tracy Morgan. Um, oh, okay. she's been... Yeah, so that was, um, that was the founder of the institute that I went to is modern and is modern. And one of the big some of the big concepts of, of modern that has stuck with me is joining and the contact function. And so, gosh, I'm really, I really try as an analyst to, and as a person, just, I don't like the word should, I mean, just I'm just trying to eliminate it completely from my vocabulary as a person, as an analyst, you know, whatever, just, it's just like no good comes of it. Um, I should do this thing. I need to do this thing. Like it's not a motivating word uh, concept and it's also judgmental and so, you know, a lot of I think, you know, certainly as a beginning analyst, but, but even when you're more developed, it's like, there's this, there's this, um, I think this tendency to try to reinforce the good behavior, like the behavior that the patient is supposedly uh, trying to change. And Bromberg has this great quote, um, I'm sure you've heard of it, like uh, the patient has this illogical wish to um, change while remaining the same. And that's where kind of his ideas about recognizing the part of the patient that doesn't want to change is just as important. So I kind of like bring that attitude when I, in my work with patients, it's like, I'm not just focused on the part of you that wants to change. Like I, I sincerely try imperfectly to hold them with uh, the same respect, the part of you that doesn't want to change and the part that does want to change. And um, I found it like a really useful kind of clinical orienting paradigm to be from intersubjective systems theory, which is there's two dimensions of the transference. There's the, there's the developmental uh, dimension of the transference and there's the repetitive dimension of the transference. The developmental dimension is when the patient is feeling safe enough, they're starting to reveal things that they're uncomfortable revealing and uh, making contact with the truth and so they're kind of more open. And so that's kind of from an intersubjective or self point of view, they're resuming development that was arrested. I'm picking it up back again with a, a new interpersonal milieu that is responsive and empathic and allowing them to kind of resume this aborted development uh, that they had to curtail to maintain the tie to their caregivers. 
And so that's the repetitive dimension. Uh, or excuse me, that's a slip there because they're, they're figure ground. So the, the developmental dimension and the repetitive dimension are figure ground. And so when the development dimension is in the foreground, the repetitive dimension is the back. What's the repetitive dimension? That's when something happens in the analytic situation that makes the patient, ah, uh, so, you know, something the analyst did, I didn't like, um, now I'm feeling more closed off, uh, reluctant to reveal. So because the analyst has done something that's reminded me of past empathic failures. And now I don't want to put myself out there right now because it's kind of heralding something worse coming. And so that's what, you know, others might call resistance. Um, when it's really, it's really makes a lot of sense given their background, it's, I'm protecting myself. And so then that's kind of where the idea of rupture and repair. And so when that rupture is repaired, then the developmental dimension comes to the foreground again. And so that's a really useful kind of diagnostic concept to kind of always ask myself in, in a session or a treatment, where is, which dimension is at the foreground. And Harold Searles goes into, you know, talking about like, and I'm sure you've experienced it, this kind of like when things are clicking, like this therapeutic symbiosis where this feels really gener generative, the dialogue feels fe very rich. There's a, there's an ease uh, back and forth. Um, and that's kind of like when the developmental dimension is more in the foreground. Um, so, so working with the patient and they're struggling with a certain issue. Uh, you know, I, 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 yeah, kind of, a, it's kind of a modern thing. It's kind of like joining in the sense, like, um, if they're struggling with a particular thing to, um, let's just make up an example. Um, I wasn't able to work on that paper that's due again. Yeah, so what? What do you mean, so what? I mean, I have to turn it in. Well, what's, what's, uh, what's, what if you don't turn it in? Um, well, well, I have to make good grades. How come? I mean, just kind of like not taking it for granted that these are just givens and getting out of this, oh, it's just this dynamic of good and bad. I'm, I'm doing good behavior, I'm doing bad behavior. I want to find a little bit of a playfulness and like sort of questioning some of these assumptions, but also I want to hear from the patient, right? Cause there's, cause patients and all of us were, we're such under these influences of these shoulds, you know, Karen Horn and I talks about the tyranny of the should, like I should be, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. And it's like, it's just a terrible motivator. I, I just haven't met anyone that kind of has found freedom through having more shoulds in their life. Um, no, you have to get rid of the shoulds. That's what the freedom is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, um, so I try to like really get out of that good or bad moral paradigm. I don't, I don't know, like just, um, uh, critical super ego. Um, and Yeah, I find myself not wanting to get too entangled with their disappointment with themselves. Um, no, it's important to what Stalara would say, emotionally dwell 
with the patient. So if a patient's depressed, I don't want to jump to, oh, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Um, there's a certain amount of sitting there with the patient and going into our own experiences. And I, you know, I, I, I wish, I mean, I guess more contemporary analysts talk about this, but um, I wish kind of like I heard more Lacanians or, or Freudians talking about their vulnerabilities as analysts and the, you know, it's like, I, I don't know about you, but like, I'm basically staring down fear of breakdown with every, my own, with every patient I work with, you know, so it's, it's not some, I'm not, a, you know, wearing this cordon sanitaire, I'm just sort of completely outside of the situation, like I'm intimately involved in my own psychology and history is, is inextricably involved in what's happening. And so I think that's really, that's a really important part of the work is being able to lean into that fear of breakdown, like my own, ours, the patient and I, the patient's fear of breakdown, my fear of breakdown, the breakdown happening between us. And I think that's really what's unique about psychoanalysis is that whereas I think a different approach, a different psychotherapeutic approach might say, you know, it appears like this isn't working. So I'm going to refer you to a trauma specialist or, or, or what have you. Um, I think a psychoanalyst is, is, has reason to not do that and has theoretical and perhaps experiential reasoning to not do that is to actually, um, for transformation to occur, failure has to occur. And sometimes at a very deep level for both the analyst and, and the patient. And so I think failure, you know, Winnicott's fear of breakdown is, is, is very much a part of, of treatment. And so as an analyst, I have to kind of court my deepest fears, especially when treatments reach impasses or ruptures. And I think that's a, I don't know, it's just kind of sine qua non of, of psychoanalysis in a way is that we have to kind of go to the, the, the depths with the patient. And uh, George Atwood has this article, I think it's called, Where's the Blood? And he's, he, it's, it's, it's like a blog article, it's on his website. And it's basically like him, like hearing this presentation by this analyst that was, you know, very clockwork and I made this interpretation and I made that and it was very sanitized. And you know, at the end of it, George Atwood is like, uh, where, where's the blood? And, um, and what he meant by that is like, where's the analyst blood in this? There's no kind of, um, it doesn't seem like there's any kind of involvement that the analyst had to confront anything. And I think that's a big part of what I, how I work is that you know, there's a paper called Why the Analyst Needs to Change and um, by Flavin. And I think it's kind of necessary that the analyst has to confront himself on some level in order for the treatment to move forward. On some, I mean, that's what's kind of unique about what we do is that I mean, I don't want to be so arrogant as to say, like, <laughs> people don't deal with 
psychological issues at whatever job that they're at and, and there's potential for growth and that kind of thing. As analysts, I think that we are confronted on in a lot of different kinds of areas, our own psyche, because each patient evokes something different. So it is kind of unique in that sense that there, there's kind of, you know, not a lot of jobs that do that where you're forced to confront this aspect of yourself that like you never normally would if you're asking like there would be no reason why but because everyone has their own uh different psychology you know when you get together with someone else it becomes this kind of storm and um so it's important for the analyst to be you know, not done just kind of like, oh, be in therapy, but like to to bring these the stuff in consultation to be able to talk about it and to be able to have some kind of knowledge of it. And I think a useful concept for me is this idea of the personal equation. And as analysts, we all have our own personal equation, which is something we bring to every single treatment and it's not just oh it's co-created it's something kind of intrinsic to who we are that gets evoked differently by different people and evoked in different degrees but that it's really important to understand like what your buttons are because um they're going to be pushed and um And so that's where your own psychoanalysis and supervision comes in really, really handy. And, um, but it's important to know your own psychology and the things that, you know, it's like, I don't care how many analyses you've been in or how great your analyst was or whatever, you're still gonna have things that are incomplete and that are like kind of wounds that are never gonna fully heal and they get get um, reopened with different patients. Am I talking too much? No, it's wonderful. Um, it is getting close to the end of the hour. We have about 10 minutes left. I want to make sure also to talk about your Twitter and how oh. did you intentionally develop your Twitter like to be this kind of great like debating psychoanalytic theory space or did this just happen over time from you posting all these great quotes and papers and questions yeah, i don't know it kind of it kind of developed you know and i it's funny because it was twitter was like driving me crazy and i deleted my account in like 2019 and just deleted my NYC therapist account completely. You know, you waited the whole 30 days and everything was gone. And then like around when the pandemic hit, I started again and I was like, eh, let's see if NYC therapist is still available. And it was, I, I couldn't believe it. It was still available. Uh, no one had picked it up in that time. So I started the, uh, started up again. And I think because I was out of training at that point, I had a little more time to kind of devote to it. And because it's kind of like a canvas for me, I kind of like every day I'm kind of looking at it like, what, what do I want to do with it today? And so it, you know, even though it's just a tweet, sometimes I put a lot of thought into those tweets and edit them and save them and so it just kind of happened. I don't know how it happened. It just started. Uh, it just started to happen. And and then as I got more followers and all, the other thing I love about Twitter too, is I've met so, so many interesting people like yourself. And, and so I've been influenced by other people and it's, expanded my thinking of psychoanalysis. And I, it's when I, for the longest time, it was, I was really confined to the consulting room. And so now it's kind of opened up into like, well, what kind of other applications are, is psychoanalysis capable of? 
And so now that I have a following, I'm really like view it as kind of this opportunity and this platform to put out ideas that are, I don't know, might be controversial or um, unsettling um, because I know that I have a following and I'm, I'm trying to kind of, you know, I'm trying to kind of radicalize people a little bit on, on my Twitter and um, get them to like, get them to, I mean, I look, as you know, I love talking about clinical technique and I'll talk about that until I'm blue in the face, but I'm also like, well, how, how else, like, what have other people said about psychoanalysis than the people who are used to reading and, um, and how can we use psychoanalysis outside of the consultant? So I don't know, it just kind of like happened like that. And now it's like this, I mean, I feel very fortunate that I have this platform to say whatever I want. No, it's great because I find one of the things I find frustrating with social media in general is that everyone's kind of turning into an expert where they're like, everyone's constantly like giving advice and like, I don't know who needs to hear this, but you know, da, 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 that kind of thing. And it's like, all of a sudden everyone's like an expert on everything and everyone's like a self-help guru, you know? <laughs> but I like your feed because you're constantly like, first of all, quoting people that, like you said, aren't just like, you know, Freud, like Cotton, like the main guys, but you quote a whole range of different analysts from different theories. Uh, it's really great and eclectic, but also you pose questions in a way that like, is generative and like generates discussion and makes people think and opens up questions rather than like just telling people what this is exactly how you describe your work too you know like instead of being like this is my interpretation of what's going on it's like constantly getting people to kind of question and sit with and kind of open up um, and explore rather than kind of locking things down absolutely that's that's a really like i hadn't quite notice that until you put it into words like that but that is kind of like there is kind of a, a crossover in in the way clinically in the way i approach my twitter feed which yeah is to like open things up even when you know i i find one of the most interesting challenges is when someone just says something kind of critical about something i tweeted i love finding a way to respond to that tweet in a way that opens up transitional space because i could just be like well you know you don't know what the hell you. <laughs> you obviously you know don't know anything about psychoanalysis so it's just like and but also like acknowledge that maybe there's some truth to what you're saying like i don't know you know and it's like and so just opening up like i want to like kind of i don't know i kind of want to i want to build alliances like you know i i I don't want to, um, yeah, like you said, I just, it's, it's so boring to me to be like, no, no, no this is how it should be. Um, it's just, <laughs> what fun is that? There's no, there's no, like you said, there's no intercreativity around that. There's no transitional space. It's just me. Yeah. It gets into this whole, you should do this. I don't want to be a moral authority on things. Like, I just want to like, I want people to, to think about things and 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 think about things with me and I don't know and maybe you're right you know um, yeah so yeah that's what that's the same kind of approach I, like a certain kind of fallibility and openness and um, curiosity let's be curious. And it's kind of like, how far can I stretch myself and being just open, you know? And I think I could do, a, I think I could be even a lot more open in terms of, you know, I, I don't, I don't admit what I'm ignorant about very much on Twitter, you know? And um, there's something about it that's very uh, appealing, but also very scary about doing. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. I don't I don't pose really dumb questions on Twitter that I don't know. Why? Because I'm I'm afraid of people seeing me as less knowledgeable or less of an expert. But there's something about that that's so 
amazing just to model that kind of radical ignorance. I don't know about this. Like, how much more can you learn when you just admit that you don't know something? You know, instead of like having to come across as someone who knows things and I'm just going to keep these like sectors of knowledge cordoned off because I don't want anyone to know I don't know anything, but I don't know a lot, you know? All of us don't know a lot. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> it's like we all know the things we know, but I feel like the more you learn, the more you realize there's so much that you don't know. And and one of the things I love about humans is like any like any curiosity or like hobby or just anything you could think of in the world, there are like people who have like gone into that like so deep you know <laughs> like with with anything anything you can think of that it's just like yeah yeah it's just amazing you can there's so much to know and there's no way we're gonna know and yeah i've gotten very comfortable with not knowing because yeah this like you know what do you expect there's only so much time in the day you know <laughs> yeah that's such a great point. I mean, like, you know, when I started training, I was like, oh my God, there's so much I don't know. And it's like, and then I finished training. I was like, wow, you know, like, there really is even more, you know, now I knew enough of the basic landscape to know like, wow, there is more than I ever, could have ever imagined that I don't know. Exactly. And like, like you said, with all these different analysts that you mentioned, like I know their names, but I actually haven't read a lot of them. And so I wrote down every book that you mentioned. So we can link to that for people who want to like vis revisit those papers and books or visit those papers and books. Um, and so that I have them documented so I can visit those papers and books. <laughs> I love what, you, what you're doing here. Thank yeah. you. I feel like this has become, especially since the pandemic, like this is my entire like collegial life and social life. It's like I get at least like one kind of little private lesson a week. <laughs> where I get to hear someone's point of view and learn about all these resources. <laughs> it's great. It's my continuing education. 